Hey guys, welcome back to another episode, and to newcomers, welcome to the channel. Today we finally take our first step into a galaxy far, far away, and play one of the very toughest and most notorious Super Nintendo games out there, Super Star Wars. To say this game and series takes itself pretty seriously would be an understatement, as it becomes clear that any combination of effort and skill less than a true Jedi Masters will inevitably leave you crumbling and begging for mercy at its true game over screens. The further you get into this intergalactic and chaotic world, the more you start to wonder, how could any mere mortal from our planet find a way to get through this merciless, submission-forcing gauntlet? Even Luke Skywalker himself on the start screen can't keep a straight face, as he knows just how twisted and evil of a task it is to make it through this adventure. But for the most determined and aspiring of Jedi Knights, there's a whole lot of excitement to be had with the various stage settings, crazy enemy and level design, with outrageously large and intimidating boss fights that really come together for an outstanding audiovisual experience. It also did its job very well as a rental title, making the player see what the Super Nintendo was capable of even as early as 1992, but surely not many would be able to overcome this test in only a three day period, directly resulting in some additional sales for those that wanted more. With all of that being said, let's dive right into the 14 levels of Super Star Wars and see just what it takes to make it through these levels. It's important to note just how seriously the developers clearly took the job of getting these cutscenes right and for those that can relate or remember, being able to clear a stage was so exciting because you felt so rewarded and satisfied getting to experience the next cutscene or cinematic, which were really well done. So we'll be taking a look at those as we go along through this adventure as well. First things to mention is how Luke controls. You can run with a D-pad and have a blaster weapon with Y. When you are shooting, you are unable to run at the same time. However, you can shoot while in the air, so you'll quickly realize that jumping forward while shooting is a much quicker and less annoying way to move through the levels. You can crouch in this game too, and if you actually press down, forward, diagonally with the jump button, Luke will slide, and if you spam this, you can make it through stretches much faster than you would run, and even outpace the enemies this way. The jumping is just a little stiff and sometimes slippery. You have a standard jump as well as a higher somersaulting jump. Important to note that if you hold up to jump while shooting, you can surprisingly jump higher than just your typical somersaulting super jump. Other important things to mention is that there are some power-ups to grab like temporary invincibility, hearts to recover health, time bonuses, lightsaber shaped health extenders to enhance your lightsaber shaped health bar, which only lasts for one level by the way, a bomb you have for a short period of time, and the most important I'd argue for this adventure is your blaster enhancements, which can stack up to a fifth power level, which is amazing and gets extremely powerful. However, a single death puts you back to your base strength, which does suck pretty bad and takes a couple levels to get back to that point. A constant theme throughout the side-scrolling levels in Super Star Wars is that there are consistently a ton of enemies and you can rest assured it gets much worse than on level 1. For the Star Wars fans out there, I'll be sure to refer to these enemies by their name the best I can using the manual. And we can see that this stage is covered in sandworms, scorpions, and womp rats too. They do take some creative liberties in order to make it a more exciting and climactic experience with a boss fight at the end of almost all of these side-scrolling stages, such as pulling monsters from another movie or other parts of its universe, or just being its own creation entirely. Our first boss fight is against the Sarlacc Pit Monster. This beast is actually from Return of the Jedi when Luke and his friends are about to have to walk the plank to their doom, but here we just encounter it out in the desert. It's definitely worth mentioning that they do an excellent job with making these fights intense and exciting. That aspect is done really well throughout the game. Fortunately for us, this fight isn't too bad as long as you get here with some decent health and keep your blaster going throughout it. The Sarlacc dips below the surface and hints at where it'll pop up with its tentacles, plus also throws rocks or reaches to you if you're close enough. It's a fight that you really can pretty much overpower as long as you don't put yourself in terrible spots and just keep shooting, you will be just fine. In the following cutscene is where Luke meets C-3PO for the first time, and you're asked to help find R2-D2 since he's been captured by the Jawas. So 
the next level actually takes place in a vehicle. There are a couple stages like this where you're in a ship, a land speeder to be exact, and this is a great example of the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 capabilities, which was used in some other big titles, most notably F-Zero for example. So I can definitely tell this is a level where I'm sure people made it very hard on themselves. If you press down on the gas, it depletes your jet fuel, and if that empties out, the level's over. There are some fuel refills out there that you can grab, albeit pretty awkward since you can only turn to change direction if you're pressing down on the gas to use the fuel. But you never have to do this since you're able to move forward, back, and side to side while facing one direction without using any jet fuel, just moving at moderate speed. And this does allow you to complete the level since all you need to do is trigger Jawas and shoot them down. Just moving up until you see them coming and then moving into position as you shoot makes this whole thing pretty simple. I can imagine being a kid trying to use the jet fuel and turn all around, it would make this so much more difficult and confusing, but it really is quite simple if you have the right strategy. Once you gun down 20 of these guys, you're told to head toward the sand crawler, which you can see off into the distance, and you're able to jet on over there to the next level. Next stage, we are on foot again, approaching that gigantic sand crawler, which looks pretty awesome. The idea with this level is that it's very, very heavy on platforming, with some scattered enemies or hazards throughout. So that super tall shooting jump is what you'll be doing a lot of. If you were to fall more than just a couple of times, that timer in the corner becomes more and more of a factor. Definitely have to adjust to the uniqueness of how Luke feels as you jump around, and something nice that you can do is use L and R to adjust your screen up and down to give yourself the best chance at seeing all of your surroundings. You do jump around for quite a while, maybe around 3 minutes or so, if you don't fall, until you're at the top, boarding the sand crawler, and once you jump over or blow through a decent stretch of turrets, you can finally enter the next level. Level 4 takes place inside of the sand crawler, of course, and between last level and this, I would say is the first difficulty barrier that probably held back a decent percentage of its players. While blowing through the Jawas and hazards with what is hopefully an upgraded weapon at this point, in all directions, aside from directly below you for whatever reason, really isn't that bad. The stretch of a few minutes with everything going on can wear on your health though, if you aren't careful and diligent when picking up parts. One particular type of obstacle that I can guarantee held back kids, and is probably responsible for many controllers and cartridges getting thrown, is the very specific and tight timing that is required to slide by these damaging force fields. If it was a matter of simply getting hurt and moving on, that would be one thing, but no, they have collision detection and require a perfect slide to get by, and it's such a tight squeeze that you'll often take damage even if you do get by. When first playing with these, it definitely can take 5-10 to 10 tries just to get it right, so it really can be a bit of a roadblock for sure. But where things get incredibly dangerous is toward the end of the level, as the isometric viewpoint and slightly stiff control can make it very easy to slip into the sand, or lava as it's supposed to be, that, you wouldn't know it, kills you immediately. And of course that means losing your power-ups and getting sent backward a couple minutes and to face off against those annoying force fields again. That's only a whiff of cheap artificial difficulty right there, and the aroma of bullshit only thickens the further we go along. Speaking of that, we face off against the lava beast Joenko, who actually makes his first appearance in this game. When reading about it, there's a lot of strange, trivial info on this thing, with some of it that I couldn't imagine is actually canon or true. Like Shmi, or Shmai as some people say it, the mother of Anakin, Darth Vader, was believed to be a witch and even a mate with this thing. What? Who wrote that? The stuff I can buy into though is that it's a gigantic pet of the Jawas that they kept down here in the deep layer of the sand crawler to keep watch over R2-D2. The extremely frustrating and difficult aspect of this fight is that these fire snake type things have collision on them and can easily push you right off the edge into an immediate death. You absolutely need to keep steering yourself center and jump before you're nudged off, losing your power ups and having to do a lot of this nonsense over again. At least they give you a bunch of health boosts right before you get here, but that's just because they know how brutal this fight is. And obviously all of this health upgrade doesn't do anything for you when you land in the lava. They even test your nerves with a couple more jumps. We are rewarded with another cool cutscene where we do see R2-D2's message from Princess Leia and realize that now we must track down Obi-Wan Kenobi. Level 5 takes place in Land of the Sand People, where Drogs, Minox, Jawas, Womp Rants, and of course eventually, Sand People are here trying to stop you. Having an upgraded blaster helps, and also grabbing constantly dropping health, it really isn't so bad to get through these long stretches of caves with these enemies, and you'll soon realize that your very worst enemy is the painfully cruel platforming section where your jumping has to be absolutely perfect to not slip off of these unexplainably narrow floating pieces of rock. 
a fair amount of which will start to crack and then crumble away if you do not move forward quickly enough. The absolute worst aspect of these sections though are the damn Minox that fly around, cheaply knocking you off course for a lost life. It's pretty dang ridiculous and annoying having your plasma getting downgraded back to your wimpy blaster due to something as stupid as that. They really didn't need to give those damn bats any collision at all. They knew exactly what they were doing though, especially with this section ending jump where you can't even see what you're supposed to land on, but channeling your inner Jedi and making it happen is the only way you're going to reach Obi-Wan. We then have a mid-level cutscene, and once again, it's really well done. One has to ask, if you can make Luke look this great here, what in the world happened on the start screen? Obi-Wan finally sees the message and gives you a lightsaber, accompanied with some classic words of wisdom. Use the Force, Luke. For the sake of footage, I did play with the lightsaber for a while, but in this game, I'm so sorry and disappointed to say it, but the lightsaber is actually a pretty big letdown. You'd expect it to tear through some enemies easier, but really what it does is it puts you in more harm's way and results in you taking more damage. It honestly feels like a bit of a trap weapon, of course you're going to want to use it, but it makes some places so much more difficult, like when you have to take down these humongous bantha creatures. It's just way easier to do with your blaster. It's just another couple minutes of tearing up constantly spawning sand people, and it's nothing too different or insane from the levels before it. Eventually we come to a large mutant womp rat, which would really be a horrible fight if you were to use a lightsaber, but if you have the intuition to switch back to your blaster, you'll realize that it's pretty much stunlocked towards the back of the screen as long as you keep jumping and blasting away, making it one of the easier moments in the game. Level 6, we have another land speeder section that is pretty much the same thing as what we went through in level 2. The layout might be a bit different, but nothing really impacts your strategy of creeping forward to finding Jawas and then sliding back into position to take them out before they're able to do too much harm to you. After you do this for 20 of these guys, then you're told to head toward Moe's Isley. Getting into Moe's Isley itself is the 7th, and I wish I could say the final desert theme stage in a row. The amount of players that tried this game back in the day and never even got to see the outer space must be staggering. We finally encounter stormtroopers, which is really great, and it makes you feel like you're finally getting somewhere. Fortunately for the pace of everything, there really isn't an insane amount of things to go over. You basically just continue to run to the right, tearing up stormtrooper ass with your weapons, grabbing hearts when needed, trying to avoid or quickly getting through a couple hazards like the fields of spikes. One really cool thing about your lightsaber is that when you do a super jump, it can take out things around you, which looks and sounds really awesome. They did a nice job changing up the foreground and background to match the setting, and after a solid three minutes or so, you finally meet Chewie to end the stage. What's pretty interesting and inaccurate is that he becomes an available ally right here, before you even meet Han Solo. But based on next stage, I can tell you that there's a direct difficulty balancing reason for this. Chewie is actually a really important character in this game, since his gun starts out at a higher power level than Luke, and his health is substantially larger. Now that we're here in the Cantina fight, we encounter five different alien enemies, Sivrak, Labria, Honda Boba, Garindan, and Greedo himself. This is definitely a musical theme and overall setting that I'm sure Star Wars fans can really appreciate, which is pulled off really well. It's overall not too difficult when just pumping the enemies full of your upgraded weapon, moving to the right, and snagging their dropped health. This just lasts a few minutes like many of the stages before it, but the reason why it's so unbelievably important that we have a character like Chewie now will become clear with one of the very biggest hurdles that this game throws your way. When we talked about creative liberties and bosses, well how's this one for you Star Wars fans? The Kalhar Boss Monster. Do you recognize this guy? Because you won't from any fight scene in the movie. He's actually from the hologram chess scene, 
when R2-D2 is playing against Chewie. Isn't that just so bizarre that they took this creature from that and made it into a relentless boss fight? What the heck is going on? So the fact that we are using Chewie to take down this creature is pretty hilarious and kind of serves as some type of revenge, really. But the fight itself is actually painfully cheap. Like, you just need to keep your weapon going constantly while hoping to get lucky as you jump around, desperately wishing that his long arms and neck won't hit you every single time that they come out. Even with the plasma gun and Chewie's extra health, you can see that I am barely getting through this fight. The hitbox is huge, and there's seriously no pattern whatsoever. You just get trapped and, to be honest, fucked senselessly in the corner, with only a prayer that your life bar will outlast his. Next cutscene shows Han Solo and Chewie together at the table, which is funny because we obviously were just playing with Chewie, but now we finally have our full team together, and for sake of footage, let's try out Han. Looks like we aren't headed to space quite yet, as we have another desert level in Escape from Mos Eisley. Basically the deal is it's just another level stacked with stormtroopers and spikes. There's a bit more emphasis on platforming in this one, and more options and floors for some vertical movement, but overall, you're just blasting troopers along with some droid-like enemies, and a couple more minutes of this is all it takes to finally reach a halfway maintenance robot boss. If you get to this thing with enough health and keep your shots going, that's really all it takes. Now things continue in a bit more of an industrial setting, and this means there are some other obstacles like metal claws or beams of electricity to look out for. It's easy for things to chip away your health since the enemies just keep coming, and there's a lot to look out for, so Chewie really comes in clutch again. As long as you try to not be totally careless around all the traps and obstacles, plus pick up hearts, you'll eventually come to the Hover Combat Carrier, which is another Super Star Wars original. The idea is to stay low and out of the way, trying to pick apart its multiple gun points so you can finish this thing off. As you can see, it's not an easy thing to do at all, and I barely made it through this fight, after multiple deaths. You get absolutely blown away if you're not in the right place. The more of its sections and weapons you take out, the faster the ship moves around, and they really don't hand over this fight at all. After nine brutal levels, we are finally boarding the Millennium Falcon and have just five levels out here in space. Just like in the movie, the magnetic field actually pulls us into the Death Star, and level 10 takes place in the hangar. Fortunately for the pace of everything, there isn't a whole lot different from the flow of this level as you just continue to press onward, jumping and shooting to the right with enemy droids and stormtroopers. However, there are a couple of bottomless pits that normally aren't a big deal, but once in a while, just the right amount of bullshit in any situation can see to it that you fall to your doom. After a couple minutes of blowing through enemies, you reach an Imperial defense droid, which apparently greatly resembles a B-1 series worker droid. However, this defense droid is pushing 18 feet in height and made specifically for the Death Star hangars. What's really nice is that once you slide underneath to the back of this thing, you really aren't in much danger at all and can just patiently wait until its weak spot is exposed and land as many shots as you can. After a while of doing this, we are on our way to level 11, where we rescue the princess. So, level 11 has a bit more going on with it, where we start out just going down a hallway, but quickly encounter instant kill crushing traps that you just have to quickly slide or run through. A pretty cool pseudo 3D perspective that it has going on is with its background hallways, where enemy droids actually fly out, and that's pretty darn clever to give it another dimension in this way. The stage is like a major onslaught of all these little robots and some platform sections used to scale. There are a fair amount of these alien type enemies towards the end of the game, they didn't even list them in the manual, but basically they go down just fine with enough bullets and always drop a big heart to reward your efforts. The detention guard is a stormtrooper in a big hovering machine again. Fortunately, it really isn't that bad just to stand your ground and unload your upgraded weapon into this thing when it has its openings. The enemies it does drop also gives you hearts too, which is always helpful. After not too long, we finally rescued the princess and we're going into the last couple of stages in the game.
Level 12, Tractor Beam Core. Here we've got a stage with a lot more emphasis on vertical platforming than ever before, as we need to hop from moving platform to moving platform in order to scale this gigantic Death Star Core. Blasting down these little guns is what you'll spend a lot of your time doing, and just trying to make sure you don't have a horrendous fall after climbing up for several minutes at a time. Something you may not even care to recognize until this point is the fact that if you're holding down the jump button, your character will continuously jump until it's released, which can sometimes happen on accident after it feels like you've already let go of the button. And it's something to definitely pay attention to and be aware of as you try to be sure-footed up this long, tall stage. After a couple minutes, you eventually come to the tractor beam power level boss. The point of all this, as you might remember in the movie, is that Obi-Wan actually infiltrates the tractor beam power generator trench, specifically to sever the connection of tractor beam 12 of section N6 in order to allow the Millennium Falcon to escape. I can tell you that this fight is pretty darn strange, since it can feel downright impossible with projectiles going all over the place and dealing heavy damage to you, while this thing has a gigantic life bar. Worse yet, if and when you die here, you get sent all the way back down to the bottom of the stage. Talk about frustrating. But what you might realize when you get back here is that sanding off to the bottom or side can somehow result in you not having to deal with any of these problems. I wasn't expecting it at all, but when trying to fight from the bottom of the screen, none of those projectiles appeared at all, so it really was just down to standing there until the fight was over. This late in the game, I guess I'll take it. After this, we get the cutscene and dialogue of the final standoff between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader. We also see the escape of the Millennium Falcon, and the start of our final attack on the Death Star, which all look and sound amazing, and gets your excitement to an all-time high. The last stretch of this game is technically divided and labeled into two levels, although it really kind of feels like just one, and that'll become more clear soon. Overall, I mean the whole thing is just as ridiculous and stressful as it looks. You don't even control how fast you're going, the frame rate is super low, and towers can pop in your face with very little warning, killing you instantly. And could you imagine getting this far just for some stupid garbage like a string of towers to send you all the way back to the beginning of the game? The thought just makes me shudder. To be fair, it has to be said, this is absolutely amazing for its time, and the whole experience is really crazy. You have to take down 20 TIE Fighters and 20 Towers, while somehow not getting your health chipped away or having it all mended immediately by a tower. It's insane and takes a couple minutes to make it happen, if you can even get yourself to do it. My strategy has ended up being a bit of a swerve left to right, really trying to react in time if a tower was coming my way, because I totally lost way too many lives like that. Once you take out enough TIE Fighters and Towers, you have officially entered level 14, the Trench Battle. Now this is some serious shit right here. The sounds get all echoey and really makes you feel immersed in the experience. You have to fend off more oncoming enemy shots and trying to last long enough to face off against Darth Vader. It's really quite epic to have this final part in the cockpit and I can only imagine how many Star Wars fans that actually managed to get this far completely lost it with how cool this is, with your radar and scanners counting down those precious meters until you finally have your shot. You know what absolutely sucks about this moment though, is that if you don't hit the right button in time, you actually get kicked back out to do the entire level 13 again, before you can get back down into the trenches for another try, which is clearly what happened to me. Had to get after it again, nervously trying to finish this off before I inevitably would lose my lives and get sent back to the beginning of the game. I just couldn't let it happen. Eventually, I got back down in there, and when the moment came, I made sure to hit all of the buttons and you know what? I got the shots off and... It glitched. Yeah, you heard me right. I got stuck. 
Now, what I believe happened here was that I did get the shots off, but just too late to count, but also before it kicked me out of the stage, resulting in some kind of tie, where the game is completely softlocked and I can't do anything at all. And you know what? Since I already earned my way here, I thought it might not be that big of a deal to look for some type of stage select or code to get to the final stage again to finish things off for the footage, but I legitimately could not find a single one that worked anywhere. Man, over an hour into playing too. Well, overall, in conclusion, Super Star Wars... Just what the heck do you think you're doing? What do you mean? What do you mean, what do you mean? When you play through Super Star Wars, it ends with a kaboom. A big Death Star kaboom. Oh yeah, that. Well, it's softlocked, man. I really, really tried, but it glitched out at the end. You tried. Yeah. Tried. Yeah. You're saying you tried. Man, I ought to come rip that Star Wars shirt right off of you because you haven't learned the first thing about being a true Jedi warrior. What makes you say that? Do these words mean anything to you? Do or do not. There is no try. Okay? <laughs> Unbelievable. Maybe this will help you. Do or do not. There is no try. Oh man. How could have I been so foolish?